Silence. No one around. Only the pale moon indifferently overlooking the darkness-shrouded earth. I decided to leave the car on the next street to avoid waking curious neighbors with the noise of the engine. I unlocked the gate of my home, once again glad that I had oiled the hinges at some point. Turning the handle, I found myself on a tiled path leading to the front porch. Good thing it wasn't gravel, otherwise my steps would have been heard from a mile away. Like a ninja, I reached the entrance noiselessly. I quickly disabled the alarm and inserted the key into the lock. The lock clicked softly, and I found myself in the spacious hall. It was cooler in the house than outside. Vera probably turned on the air conditioner for the night. I looked around. No one! The ticking of the antique wall clock was clearly audible. I headed for the staircase leading to the second floor. Slowly, so as not to creak the steps, I ascended. The moonlight barely lit the corridor, making it pitch dark. I immediately noticed the thin strip of light barely breaking through the slightly ajar bedroom door. I approached the door and listened. Someone's snoring was audible from inside. Hardly during the time I was away did my Vera take up this masculine habit. So, besides Vera, there was someone else in there. I carefully opened the door. It creaked softly, and a delightful scene unfolded before me. I was even touched. A naked shepherdess and shepherd slept, tightly embracing in our marital bed. Rural pastoral. They were like a painting. I would have painted it if it weren't for my wife Vera in the role of the shepherdess and some loudly snoring hairy monster in the role of the shepherd. My wife had laid her tousled head on the lover's chest, covered in curly fur, and seemed to be having some wonderful dream. In her sleep, she smacked her lips and smiled happily. I had a rough idea of what she might be dreaming about. I sat down in a chair and sat silently for a while. Then I shook my head and approached the bed. I transferred the gun to my left hand and gently scratched the hairy monkey's chest with my right. The curly lover slowly opened his eyes and blinked. Surprise! As he started to rise, ruthlessly dropping my wife's head from his chest, I punched him hard in the jaw. The lover of other men's wives groaned and lost consciousness. What did you expect a knockout? Vera woke up from his careless movement. For a while, she couldn't understand what was happening, then terror appeared in her eyes. George, it's not what you think. She stammered. How banal. She must have read too many women's romance novels. Interesting, what should I think, catching you in our bed with a hairy, stinky man? I sneered, and Vera shivered at my smirk. What, did you trip and accidentally fall on his soap? Or something else? Then tell me, what? But my Vera was silent. She couldn't come up with a convincing excuse. I sighed sympathetically. Poor girl. Judging by his appearance, her hairy bastard resembled a watermelon vendor from the Central Market. A guest from the sunny South. Yes, Vera had fallen far. Couldn't find someone more decent or was so desperate that she didn't care who she brought to bed. She brought the first one she found. She should have been a young maiden, seeing a man's core for the first time and melting with desire. But no! A family mother, who had been through many life hardships with me, a 34-year-old woman. What is happening to people? All these thoughts buzzed in my head like a swarm of wasps. I had only one way out. Kicked the cheating whore out onto the street, along with her bastard. Vera's hope grew from my silence. She took my prolonged pause as my weakness and thought her husband couldn't part with such a treasure as her. George, I'll explain everything now. She started, but I interrupted her. Get dressed and get out of here. What? She exclaimed in astonishment. You heard me. And take your shit-eater with you. I threw her the dress, carelessly tossed on the chair. At that moment, the curly bastard came to. He muttered something indignantly in an unfamiliar language. Understandably, he forgot English words in his excitement. 
Apparently, his vocabulary wasn't big enough. I gestured with the gun towards his clothes. He instantly understood, grabbed his pants and shirt, and without further ado, dashed to the door. And what are you waiting for? I turned to my wife. Need a push? Vera dashed after her lover, and I heard their bare feet pounding on the wooden stairs. The front door slammed shut and a minute later, the gate. Good for them, they retreated quickly. Capable! What do you think of yourself? My father-in-law, the chairman of the board of directors of the Sibmash conglomerate, Prokogromov, was beside himself with anger. Everything you have is thanks to being married to my daughter. And that's the only reason I tolerate your ass in my company. I stood opposite the great boss's desk, frankly bored. I knew this conversation would happen when I threw his daughter and her lover out of my house. So I wasn't expecting to hear anything new. Think you're so proud. Mr. Gromov continued his verbal execution. His wife cheated on him. Get over it. The girl just had some fun while you were away. She's not planning to divorce you. And you threw her out the door. And a respected person, my Italian partner, too. And even beat him up. So here's the deal. If you don't calm down, I'll throw you out of the company and put you in jail. For assaulting a person. You know what I'm capable of. My father-in-law sat down in his chair and poured a glass of water. Just sit quietly and don't stand out. Or you won't even see your kids. He shouldn't have mentioned the kids. I still have to check if they're mine. After what happened, I didn't believe anything and trusted no one. If they're my sons, they're not going anywhere. They'll remain mine. Besides, the older one is already 15. The younger one, though, is only 8. But he's not a baby. And if they're not mine... I'll decide based on the facts. Whether I live with your whore daughter or not is for me to decide. I replied, looking my father-in-law straight in the eye. I'm not afraid of prison. People live there too. I'll manage. As for your company, I've already submitted my resignation to HR. I moved out of the whore's house so she can drag a whole gang of your partners there. Mr. Gromov didn't expect such audacity from me. He gasped for air, mouth agape, unable to utter even half a word. Well, that's exactly what I was aiming for. Exiting the office, I deliberately slammed the door, making the secretary sitting in the reception jump in her seat. At that moment, Vera entered the reception. Apparently, she was nearby, waiting for her father to tame her rebellious husband. She looked at me with a smug smirk, expecting me to throw myself at her feet begging for reconciliation. It couldn't be any other way. Where would this penniless man go? Especially one accustomed to a good life. But I walked past her, not turning my head. Not everything in this world follows her plans. I went into my former office, took a box with my belongings, and headed for the elevators. George, wait. I heard my ex-wife's voice behind me. Don't lose your mind. Nothing really happened. Don't make hasty decisions. She managed to catch the elevator with me. You understand, I did this for the company's interests. Nothing personal. But a very profitable contract was signed. Vera spoke rapidly, afraid I wouldn't want to listen to this nonsense. What self-sacrifice? For the sake of her father's company, my wife spread her legs. Well then, of course, that explains everything. Maybe she smoked something or swallowed pills. Or maybe she was always such a blatant fool. I wonder how many years prospective clients have been passing through her. No, I definitely need to check the children. George! Vera grabbed my sleeve. Let's talk. After all, I love you. We have children. I disdainfully removed her hand from my sleeve with two fingers. There's nothing more to talk about. 
you can peacefully sleep with your father's clients. No one will bother you. Vera's eyes filled with tears. She wanted to say something else, but employees were already looking at us, and she just silently stood and watched as I walked away, unable to stop me. I handed my pass to the security guard and went out to the parking lot. I put the box in the back seat of the car and sat behind the wheel. Apparently, this car was my most valuable possession as of today. I pulled out of the parking lot. In the rearview mirror, I saw Vera, tears streaming down her face, her arms pressed to her chest. That's it. The past doesn't count. I had no accommodation in this city. For the time being, I decided to stay at a hotel. Not an expensive one, but a modest one. I knew of one on the outskirts of the city, so I headed straight there. I paid for the room and, taking the key, went to my temporary dwelling. One room. A wardrobe against a wall, a twin bed, a bedside table with a lamp. A flat screen TV hanging on the wall. That was all the furnishings. Not bad for the time being. I'd finish my business and leave the city. I pulled out my mobile phone and dialed a number that was firmly etched in my mind. You're on the line. An unfamiliar voice sounded on the other end. But it didn't faze me. I'm calling about a job. Uncle Maxim said I could call this number. I tried to speak evenly, not revealing any emotions. One moment. There was a pause on the other end. Then a male voice said, Unfortunately, we have nothing to offer you at the moment. We already hired someone in June. But just in case, send us your resume. The call ended. I turned on my laptop and entered the search engine the password the unknown interlocutor had told me. On the closed website, there was information for me. So, welcome back, ZDAN. I managed to sleep until 8 o'clock. I was woken by loud knocking at the door. That's how plumbers, police, and cheated husbands knock. Yawning, I opened the flimsy door. Mr. Lehman? You are arrested for assaulting Mr. Leonelli. Do you have any weapons with you? The senior capture team member was practically burning holes through me with his gaze. Of course, I do. I pulled out a blued Walther from my jacket pocket and handed it to the policeman. You should have seen how the lieutenant's eyes gleamed hungrily. Do you have a permit for this weapon? Why? It's just a souvenir, a lighter. Friends gave it to me. The policeman immediately deflated and nodded to his partner. The sleepy sergeant quickly handcuffed me and led me to the car. My father-in-law, as always, kept his promises. I was put in a cell and left alone for some time. I rolled up my jacket, placed it under my head, and lay down on the hard bench. Prison is prison, but a little sleep doesn't hurt. The cell door clanged open again. George! Hello! The impressive man with noble gray at his temples carefully examined me. Are you all right? I hope the investigator hasn't spoken to you yet. Not yet, Solomon Markovich. I draped my jacket over my shoulders and shook hands with my lawyer. The disheveled police escort took us to the investigator. What followed was a matter of technique. Solomon Markovich quickly explained to the investigator that everything was not as the victim's statement suggested. On the contrary, I was defending myself against an unknown citizen who had broken into my house with criminal intent. In self-defense, I struck the citizen in the jaw. I didn't know that he was invited by my wife for sexual pleasures. The investigator pretended to believe the lawyer and released me under a restriction not to leave the area. Two hours had passed since my arrest. Well done, Solomon. Top-notch work. Having said goodbye to my lawyer, I headed to a cafe. I hadn't had time for breakfast in the morning. The day promised to be challenging, and I needed to fuel up. This cafe was hard to miss. From afar, its name stood out in big, glowing letters, even in daylight. 
All the windows facing the street were draped with camouflage net curtains. The heavy door, reinforced with steel strips, made it clear that entering meant stepping into another world, a world of tough men and tasty food. Yes, the Wild Duck Cafe knew how to surprise. I curiously surveyed the interior of the dining hall. On the walls, framed and under glass, hung time-worn electric guitars, illuminated on both sides by soft fluorescent lights. On a podium, at the far wall, stood an old Harley, clearly indicating to any random customer that they were entering the territory of a biker brotherhood. Between the guitars, antlers of animals once hunted hung, under which were placed picturesque biker posters. There weren't many customers, and a brisk waiter led me to my table. He easily convinced me to order a large mug of light beer, a seafood salad with shrimp, a seafood julienne, and a salmon steak. I agreed without protest and prepared to wait. As my ordered feast was being prepared, I slowly sipped my beer, inadvertently listening to a loud conversation at the far end of the hall, just beyond the bar counter. Finally, they brought the seafood salad. I savored the delicious shrimp, and my thoughts involuntarily plunged into the sordid reality. What to do next? First, check the kids. My next steps depend directly on that. I wanted to punish the slut and her family, especially since her father was involved in pimping. To love money so much as to sell your own daughter's body. But apparently, Vera herself enjoyed setting honey traps for her daddy's partners. Then, I planned to disappear, erasing nearly a quarter century from my life. No tears, just a waste of time spent on a worthless person. It wasn't the betrayal I would avenge, but the 25 years of my life stolen. To say I became indifferent towards my ex-wife and kids would be wrong. My heart constantly ached, and my mind was tormented by one question. How can someone be such a vile bitch? To confess love to me while simultaneously sleeping with other men. Or is this normal for the current times when the word faithfulness only elicits ironic laughter? As Vera said, nothing personal, just work. Just, Dad asked. A husband is not a wall, he will move. That's how cheating wives console their conscience, right? The noise at the bar counter distracted me from my sad thoughts. Either the conversationalists disagreed on the quality of the beer, or someone's face seemed insufficiently attractive to someone, but a brawl was clearly brewing. Senseless and merciless, as they say. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw two bouncers appear from behind the doors ready to intervene at any moment and restore order, understanding that this ruckus wouldn't end simply. Several casual customers got up and quickly left the establishment, seemingly aware of how it might end. I continued to enjoy my salad and awaited the julienne. Finally, the tension erupted. The sound of a dull thud resonated, and someone's body, clad in a leather vest, flew headfirst down the aisle. The sound of breaking glass followed. Clearly, the bottle rose was in play. Someone screamed, likely a woman. A table toppled over. The excitement was picking up. The bouncers intervened. One of the fight participants crashed into my table. I barely managed to jump back, still holding my plate of seafood salad. While the poor guy tried to get up, clinging to the table legs, an empty bottle hit his head. He twitched and went still. Peripheral vision allowed me to see an assailant rushing at me, clearly intending to harm me. I was about to be sucked into the bloody whirlpool of the fight. All right, at least I'd let off some steam. Not waiting for the blow, I tripped the charging idiot and hit him in the back of the head as he fell. One down. I scanned the battlefield, noting the lying bouncers. Only the guy with the bottle rose was a real threat. I jumped onto the bar counter and kicked the opponent in the head with the tip of my boot. The bottle fragment fell from his hand. A woman, probably caught in this whirlwind of unbridled fun, even shrieked. I leaped, knocking out another biker midair. Only one left. I wasn't sure if he was right or wrong, but I quickly struck his throat, sending him to the floor. That seemed to be it. Indeed, I felt lighter. Blood. That's what I've been missing since yesterday. Time to get out of here. I patted the pockets of the last victim and pulled out the motorcycle keys. 
Then I handed some money and a tip to the approaching waiter. I quickly walked to the parking lot and saw three bikes parked near the curb. I randomly inserted the keys into the ignition of the nearest one. A second later, the engine rumbled, and I was already shifting gears. Yes, God loves drunks and cuckolds. Suddenly, I felt someone sit behind me and wrap their arms around my torso. I'm with you. A female voice shouted right into my ear. A dose of adrenaline did calm my nerves a bit and slightly dulled the pain in my heart. I sped down the middle of the street, ignoring the honking of irritated drivers. After a couple of kilometers of motorcycle slalom, I turned into an alley. I rode about 200 meters and slowed down by the curb. Well, we've arrived. I said to the passenger, whose face I hadn't yet seen. Most likely, the offended biker had already reported the theft of his steel steed and a capture plan was already in effect. I turned around. Cornflower blue eyes of a young blonde met mine. Her short dress had ridden up, revealing gorgeous tanned legs. I stared at her for a while, trying to say something. Then I just waved my hand and quickly headed towards the nearest alley. Sir! A husky female voice caught up to me. What about me? Her tone was such that I couldn't just leave her alone. Hurry up! I turned to the blonde as I walked. As she got off the bike, her leg lifted over the seat, displaying light blue panties tightly hugging her firm buttocks. Matches your eyes. A wild thought flashed through my mind. Something similar had already happened in my life. I was born in an ordinary family. My father worked as a foreman at a factory, and my mother was a nurse in the factory's health center. We lived quietly, without scandals. My parents loved each other, which, you'll agree, is more of an exception than the rule nowadays. I was the only child in the family, but I grew up a normal boy, not spoiled by my parents. Everything was like everyone else. Kindergarten, school. I started playing the guitar in the alleyways. Then I finished music school. My father allocated money for my musical education. But I studied diligently, justifying the money spent on my education. After school, I decided to join the army. My peers and their overexcited mothers criticized it so much. My parents accepted my decision philosophically. Decided, go ahead. I went to the military recruitment office myself and was soon sent to the internal troops. I didn't go through basic training but was directly placed in a special purpose detachment, Don. I was enrolled in a reconnaissance squad of an independent reconnaissance battalion. Service began. I traveled across the country. Iraq, Central Asia, Africa. And many other places bear the traces of my boots. In our battalion, there were soldiers wearing green berets. I immediately became interested in what it meant. From civilian life, I knew that in the internal troops, volunteers undergo testing for the right to wear the maroon beret. But I hadn't heard about the green one. My company commander explained to me that the green beret is a sign of valor of the internal troops' reconnaissance. And no one gets it on the first try. No merits or ranks influence the awarding of the green beret. Only successful completion of the tests allows one to wear this sign of valor. Naturally, I was eager to earn this distinction. By that time, I had already served a year and a half, and demobilization was on the horizon. I tried three times to pass the tests, but always stumbled on some trifle. On the last third attempt, I almost completed the entire distance without penalty points. But in the end, my gun didn't fire. Dirt had clogged under the barrel box cover. And just like that, the coveted beret disappeared over the horizon. I realized it wasn't meant to be. And I didn't make any more attempts. Only sometimes I enviously looked at the lucky ones proudly wearing the green beret. Just before demobilization, we were suddenly put on alert. In half an hour, we were crammed into a helicopter. Another hot spot flared up. The helicopter hadn't even landed when we were shot at. An anti-aircraft missile hit the side of the descending helicopter. A wave of fire engulfed everyone. 
the remains of the helicopter and people were scattered for hundreds of meters. Only the commander and I survived. How and why, I don't know. When I came to, there was a ringing silence. I moved my arms and legs. Seemed intact. I grabbed my gun and cocked it. It works. Decided to get out. I had an idea of which direction to go. The sound of a car engine reached me. Time to leave. But as I was about to climb out of the crater, I heard a groan. I don't know why, but I decided to check who it was. It was the commander. I clearly understood that I couldn't get out with the wounded. So, I spat on the commander and decided to crawl to a low forest growing on the slope. I had almost reached the bushes when, by someone's higher will, I turned back, picked up the groaning commander, and with all my strength dragged him to the life-saving plantation. Two days later, we reached our own. The commander survived. When I visited him in the hospital, he quietly said to me, I thought you had left me. I blushed with shame. After all, it was true. I honestly told everything to the military investigator, hiding nothing, including my shameful cowardice. The elderly major listened attentively and had me sign the interrogation protocol. Two weeks later, I received an order for my demobilization. We were lined up on the parade ground to say goodbye to the regiment's flag. The ritual was almost over when the division commander's jeep arrived. My name was called out, and I thought it was the disciplinary battalion for my cowardice and fear. But unexpectedly, the division commander hugged me and quietly said, Thank you, son. Out of the car stepped a major, the chairman of the Green Berets Council. A few seconds later, the coveted sign of military valor was in my hands. I knelt on one knee, kissed the woolen fabric, and shouted loudly, I serve the special forces. At the train station, my company commander found me. He hugged me goodbye and handed me a small bundle. This is from the commander. A keepsake. We said goodbye, and I jumped onto the already moving train car. I stuffed the bundle into my duffel bag. There was no opportunity to look at the gift. The whole journey, my comrades and I consumed an incredible amount of alcohol. Then we started a fight with paratroopers, arguing about who was tougher. Later, we made peace and became friends. A day later, I stepped onto the platform at the station in my hometown. My parents had prepared a meal. My mother was tearful with happiness, and my father was proud of his son. The three of us sat down, talked about my future plans. In the end, my father said, You've changed, son. You've become completely grown up. In his mouth, it sounded like praise. In the evening, I unwrapped the commander's gift. It was an antique dagger in wooden sheath. When I pulled out the straight double-edged blade, it gleamed menacingly in the light of the table lamp. The white bone handle fit comfortably in my hand, resting against the forward curved guard. It was immediately clear that this was a very expensive antique piece. I wondered how it had come into the commander's possession. I didn't boast about the unusual gift to my parents, but hid it more securely in the drawer of my writing desk. There, I also placed the coveted green beret. I decided to go to the factory and at the same time began preparing to enter the technical university in the regional center. Time flew by unnoticed, and soon, along with other applicants, I began taking entrance exams. Everything went well, and I was enrolled in the first year of the mechanical faculty. I was given a dormitory room, and I began studying. I didn't have any close friends, just acquaintances. Many of my faculty peers were children of high-ranking parents in various firms and companies. They didn't care much about studying, their futures were bright and clear. I perfectly understood that my ceiling at the factory was a foreman, or at most, a workshop head. So, I didn't have high hopes for the future but studied well. My brain was yearning for knowledge. Early autumn was setting in. It was warm, and it seemed like summer wasn't ready to give up. Not a single yellow leaf on the trees. But the air distinctly smelled of impending prolonged rains and cold. 
I had just entered my fourth year and had recently returned from an internship. There was one more year of studies and a diploma defense ahead. Just a little more until the first step in my adult life. On a Saturday evening, I decided to sit in a restaurant. Sunday was ahead, so I could afford a glass of cold vodka and a beer. Near my dormitory, on the ground floor of an old building, was a restaurant with the evocative name Mongol. A rectangular sign on a sheet of iron hung on chains attached to two iron posts. The restaurant's name was intricately written on the sign, with a Mongol underneath, appetizingly showcasing skewers of meat. I entered the hall and took a corner table. I sat with my back to the wall, able to control almost the entire hall, including the entrance door. Military personality deformation only fades over the years. I ordered a portion of shashlik and fries from the approaching waiter. As I waited for my order, I leisurely savored vodka, chasing it with cold beer. My only concern was whether to stop there or order more. Finally, I convinced my conscience and settled on the former. Not far from me, at the next table, sat a pretty girl sipping a cocktail through a straw. When I sat down, she gave me an evaluative look, the kind women give to unfamiliar men when they're free and searching. Apparently, I didn't fit her criteria for a lover, and she indifferently turned away. I agreed with her assessment. Cheap jeans, a stretched-out tank top, and old sneakers. A nerd, not a nerd, but clearly a life loser. Not the type for young girls. I was finishing my vodka when I heard almost at my ear. Girl, hey girl. I turned my head and grimaced in annoyance. At the neighboring table stood three guys, classic zigits. They were smiling broadly, flashing a whole exhibition of gold teeth, rings, and chains in the light of the chandeliers. Aye, aye. Such a beautiful girl shouldn't sit alone. Look, our car dash, one of the guys nodded towards a Mercedes parked outside. Let's go for a ride. The girl was silent not knowing how to respond to the assertive zigits. Ah, I get it. You're proud, right? The zigit pulled out a wad of crumpled dollars from his pocket. Don't worry, we'll pay, whatever you ask. He grabbed the girl by the hand and, ignoring her weak attempts to free herself, dragged her towards the exit. The waiters and the respectable clientele pretended nothing was happening. I gestured for the waitress and ordered more vodka and beer, inquiring about the shashlik I had ordered earlier. Then I wiped my lips with a napkin and went outside. The amorous zigits had almost dragged the girl into the car. She was crying loudly, still hoping someone would come to her aid. I tapped the fidgety macho on the shoulder. He turned around, annoyed. I silently hit him with the knuckles of my fingers right between the eyes. A great move if done correctly. The jidget silently collapsed right under the wheels of the car. The second assailant let go of the girl and stared at me in surprise, alternating his gaze between me and his fallen accomplice. Then, deciding something for himself, he tried to punch me in the face. But his hand missed, and as I moved to the right, I landed a side blow to his jaw. No second hit was needed. He staggered for a while, then tripped and fell face down on the asphalt. It's all good, boss. The third guy approached me. Sorry, we got it wrong. I swear on my mother. We didn't know she was your woman. We'll leave now. I disdainfully looked at the walking jewelry store and extended my hand to the girl. Get out. She stared fearfully at the guests from the south, then clutched my hand and jumped out of the car. I escorted her to the sidewalk and returned to the restaurant. When I entered, the noise in the hall momentarily subsided. I downed my vodka, chased it with beer, and left without waiting for the shashlik, leaving money on the table. My mood was ruined for the evening. I bumped into the girl at the university. She called out to me. I didn't get a chance to thank you. If it weren't for you, I don't know what they would have done to me. She said in a beautiful chest voice, pressing her hands to her throat. My name is Vera. You shouldn't be wandering around bars, Vera. 
I thought to myself. But I said nothing out loud. Honestly, I didn't know how to get rid of her. I nodded and was about to run away. But she grabbed my jacket lapel. I have to thank you. Let's go somewhere. It's on me. She smiled charmingly and looked into my eyes. I shrugged. Does she think I'm a miser? That evening, we sat in a cafe, and Vera seemed to me a smart and goal-oriented girl. I was impressed that she knew what she wanted from life. In May of the following year, we got married. Vera's father, by that time at the very top of the executive pyramid, had arranged a position for me in his company. So, even before graduating from university, I found myself in the murky stream of office plankton flowing through the dirty river of industrial business. I took the chair of the deputy head of the technological department, with one, but very responsible duty to please the daughter of the general director to the best of my ability. Which I did with all the proletarian hatred in the first few years. Then, a son was born, and seven years later, a second one. Vera was surrounded by nannies and relatives. The children were constantly with their grandmother and grandfather. My parents were reluctantly allowed to see the throne heirs. After my mother saw her eldest grandson, she looked at me strangely but said nothing. And I didn't bother to ask why. There was no time. I was oblivious to everything around me, my head spinning from love for my wife. Meanwhile, time relentlessly moved forward. Eight years later, our second son was born. My happiness knew no bounds. A wonderful, loving wife, two sons. All that was left was to build a house. A year later, we had a house. All this time, I worked in her father's company. True, I didn't climb the corporate ladder, but I wasn't too bothered. There was enough money. My father-in-law constantly threw a decent sum for the grandchildren and daughter. Vera was always bustling around the top. I didn't even know what position she held in her father's company. Now, finally, I do. But she was always present at meetings, contract signings, and corporate events. Speaking of corporate events, in the first years of our marriage, Vera constantly dragged me to various events organized by the company's management. But sometime after the birth of our first child, I stopped being invited. Vera, looking down, mumbled something about subordination. That corporate events are only for the management and prospective clients. And since I don't hold any significant position in the company yet, therefore, you get it. It took living with this whore for 16 years to realize that something was not right. The smirks of colleagues, the contempt in the eyes of my eldest son, the overt disregard from my wife. All this eventually led me to the thought that I was not living my life, but existing according to someone else's script. I got in touch with a former comrade in arms with whom I had maintained close contact and asked for help. Two weeks later, I knew a lot. I had video and audio recordings of Vera's love meetings, especially during my increasingly frequent business trips. She shamelessly brought another man home and had fun with him in her marital bed. Thankfully, the children almost always lived at her father's house. When it became clear that it was time to radically change my life, I came home late at night and caught my wife red-handed. I just couldn't understand one thing. Why did Vera need me? She never seemed to love me. Then why doesn't she divorce me? Why does my father-in-law, instead of having long thrown me out of the company, conduct soul-saving conversations? There's only one conclusion, I am needed by them. But for what? I woke up to the ringing of the phone. For a while, I lay there, listening to its annoying screeching, hoping it would stop on its own. But the phone kept ringing, as if hinting that some jerk on the other end knew perfectly well I was home. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore and answered the call. George? The caller's voice was unfamiliar to me. I looked at the screen. But my eyes were met with the succinct message, number hidden. Yes, who am I speaking with? I croaked sleepily into the phone. We have good news for you, the phone crackled, ignoring my question. 
A vacancy has unexpectedly opened up, and we've sent all the necessary information to your site. Have a good day. The caller hung up. I silently stared at the mobile phone for a while, then carefully placed it on the nightstand. I went to the table and turned on the computer. On my website, there was brief information about the upcoming job and contact numbers for inquiries. I was about to dial the number, but something held me back. I sat for a while, gathering my thoughts, then headed to the bathroom. Strangely, the light was on full blast, and I could hear water splashing. I cautiously peeked through the slightly open door and was momentarily taken aback. In the bathtub splashed a completely naked blonde. Damn! I had completely forgotten about her. Gradually, it dawned on me that I was in a motel. I remembered the scuffle in the cafe and the hijacking of the biker's motorcycle. The image of the girl also came to mind. After abandoning the motorcycle in an alleyway, the girl and I had taken refuge in a motel. What happened next was a blur, but evidently, we had quite a bit of fun. The girl plunged headfirst into the bathtub and began to climb out. She saw me clearly but paid no attention. Wipe my back. The girl handed me a crumpled towel. My guest, completely naked, stood by the window, leaning her head against the glass, looking outside. In the rays of the rising sun, her smooth skin took on a rosy hue, making her even more seductive. Long smooth legs, a slender waist, a graceful back, white straight hair cascading down her back to her waist. She resembled a large dangerous cat, ready to unleash her claws at any moment. I stood next to her, admiring the sunrise, then wrapped my arms around her waist and gently kissed her neck, nudging her towards the bed. It was time to finish what we started. I had a lot of free time now. Apparently, so did the girl. After everything was over, we lay entwined for a long time. Finally, the girl pulled away and looked me in the eye. Who are you? The question was so unexpected that I flinched. What do you mean? What do you do? How do you make a living? A slight smile touched her lips. I'm not earning anything now. I quit yesterday. The events of the previous day invaded my mind again. By the way, my name is Olga. The guest tilted her head slightly. George. I introduced myself in turn. Finally, we got acquainted. Although as they say, a bed is not a reason for acquaintance. Olga stretched and slipped out from under the blanket. I have to go. She said, dressing. Where to, she didn't specify. And I didn't ask. A no-strings-attached acquaintance. Just for one night. At the exit, she pressed against me, and I kissed her neck. Olga laughed softly and pulled away. Her eyes asked a silent question, will we meet again? But I remained silent. Olga lingered for a moment and then closed the door behind her. I stood under the contrast shower for a long time, trying to put my body and nervous system in order. The water washed away the sweat, but it didn't bring the expected freshness. I rubbed myself with a rough waffle towel and decided to shave. The realization of the inevitability of this unpleasant procedure immediately spoiled my mood. The razor blade slid over my cheeks like a skier on a slalom course, leaving a clean trail in the soapy foam. Finally, small flakes of white foam remained on my face, and I washed them off with water. From the mirror, a not-yet-old man looked back at me, but with graying temples. I splashed some Arabian cologne on myself and went to the small kitchen. I poured some sunflower oil onto a heated skillet and dropped two eggs onto its hot surface. I poured boiling water into a large cup and added two spoons of instant coffee. A royal breakfast. To somewhat improve my sour mood, I pressed the button on the cassette player. Despite its obvious vintage, my Itachi delighted me with good music. I ate while enjoying the sounds of Gary Moore's guitar. A few minutes later, I put on a silver dog tag necklace and stepped into a new day. My first stop was the court, where I wrote an application for divorce. 
I didn't seek a lawyer, rightly believing I could handle it myself. A rather young woman, who was making eyes at me the whole time I was in the court's office, accepted my application. For half an hour, I sat at the table writing the divorce application. A secretary named Alona stood next to me, pressing her right thigh against my left side. She periodically leaned over to point out the places I needed to sign. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see she was not just a gorgeous blonde but also possessed a delightful bust, which stood out beautifully against her blouse. She also exuded the scent of expensive perfume, which swirled around my head, stirring sinful thoughts. Additionally, she massaged my left side with her body, further complicating the situation. Finally, everything was written and signed. I took a copy of the application and bid farewell to the hospitable young woman. In Alona's eyes, I saw regret, or perhaps it was just my imagination. They asked me to wait in the corridor, and within half an hour, I knew the date of the first court hearing. Everything seemed fine, but I couldn't shake the feeling that my father-in-law and wife wouldn't let me go so easily. After dealing with family matters, I headed to the Forensic Medical Examination Bureau. I needed to resolve the issue of my paternity. I had been a father in every sense to my children for almost 16 years. The thought that the children might not be mine caused my stomach to clench in agony. I submitted the necessary samples. In the car, I had plastic cups from which I had given my boys drinks when we went out into nature. They were even labeled. My hands were shaking as I handed over these cups for examination. They promised not to delay and provide the results within 10 days, just before the start of the first divorce court session. It was past noon when I pulled up to a well-maintained two-story mansion located in the old part of the city. On the first floor was an art gallery with an expensive and dignified appearance, as befits a place where high art is stored. I entered a small hall adorned with paintings of various sizes and bronze and marble sculptures. I'm no art expert, but I immediately understood that the masterpieces surrounding me were worth a lot of money. Hello! A young woman emerged from behind a large sculpture, smiling cheerfully. Are you looking for something exclusive, or would you like to browse first? I would like to see Maxim Anatolievich. I said very politely. The girl's smile grew even brighter. She gestured invitingly with her hand, and soon I was standing at the threshold of a cozy office. A deep antique armchair, a large oak desk on carved legs. On it, a large antique lamp with a painted glass shade. Several paintings on the walls, a sofa, and a large bookcase made of dark wood in the corner. I noted to myself the convenient location of the office, which had an exit to the adjacent street, offering certain advantages in a critical situation. Please, come in. A pleasant male voice sounded behind me. Without looking back, I took a few steps forward. Take a seat. The same voice said, and I, turning around, shook hands with a not-so-young but still robust man in a gray business suit. As I expected, our benevolent court, always siding with women's interests, gave us two months for reconciliation. As if one could ever reconcile with such treachery. I silently listened to all this nonsense, wishing only for one thing that it all would end as soon as possible. The reconciliation months dragged on. Vera called almost every day, crying and promising mountains of gold if I forgave her and returned to the family fold. Then her father joined the process. About two weeks after the first court session, he called and asked for a meeting. We sat at a table in a small cafe. His black car was parked outside the establishment, probably with Vera inside, still hoping for reconciliation. I couldn't understand what there was to talk about in this situation, but I agreed to the meeting, hoping my former father-in-law would finally leave me alone. I won't persuade you to return to my daughter anymore, he started. I have a proposition for you. He chewed his lips, gearing up for the conversation. Vera is still young, very young. She can start her life over. So she slipped up. It happens. He paused and continued. She can still marry and have a happy family. Your marriage will be a lesson for her. I'm willing to pay you good money if you promise not to disclose the reasons for the divorce. Just say you had irreconcilable differences. 
It happens. He paused again, lighting a cigarette. I have a promising business partner who could be a good husband for my daughter and a father to her children. He grimaced at these words. What do you say? Am I to understand the children aren't mine? I chuckled. Did you know this from the start? Proker averted his gaze. The one thing I don't understand is how you could turn your own daughter into an office whore. I continued. Saving money? Silence fell. Then the father-in-law wrote a five-digit number on a napkin. Will this amount satisfy you? He pushed his writing towards me. I glanced at it. A handsome sum for silence. I think, Proker, you've got the wrong impression of me. I pushed the note back. I only want a divorce, and the rest are your family problems. I don't need your money. I won't blab about my divorce. So let your daughter sleep peacefully. This phrase sounded ambiguous. That's not all. You must leave the city. Go wherever you want, just far away. It's a flimsy, but at least some, guarantee of your silence. He stubbed out his cigarette and looked at me intently. This is my earnest request to you. He emphasized earnest and stared at me. Maybe I should jet off to Mars for good measure. Not only did his licentious daughter ruin my life, but now her father wanted to utterly displace me. I promise to keep quiet about the reason for the divorce. But I won't leave the city. Why should I? I stood up, indicating the conversation was over. Be careful, George, you might regret it later. The father-in-law gave me a cold, angry glance. What a family! Each one as bad as the other. My former relative sure doesn't like being blatantly sent on an erotic journey. With plenty of time before the second court session, I thought about getting a temporary job. I needed something to live on. But right then, I received an SMS and started working for Uncle Maxim. The oceanic coast was surrounded by a semicircular mountain range. The area was desolate, perfect for landing. Within a 10-kilometer radius, no sign of life was detected. The night crept in silently on soft paws. A gentle breeze carried the scent of the ocean and a pleasant coolness. Above us, in the coal black sky, myriad stars twinkled, clustering into constellations like stray dogs into packs. Despite the silence and calm, this world was alien and it weighed on the mind. We quickly unloaded the boat, assembling weapons and equipment. Then Snake opened the valve, and the boat rapidly deflated into a piece of tarpaulin. We hid it in a small grotto, invisible from the shore. Unlikely as it was for anyone to search for us, it's better to be safe than sorry. The small electric motor and battery were stashed there too. Well, welcome. Barhan, the leader of our small team, said. We don't have much time, we must get to work. There was still time before dawn, so we split into two trios and headed to the island capital, making the most of the dark. Snake led our trio. Judging by his initial commands, he was an experienced fighter. He confidently led us towards the city, trying to get as close as possible before dawn. As the city lights appeared in the distance, we changed into the uniforms of the National Gendarmerie and transformed into a patrol of government troops. Without hiding, we slowly moved along the highway, keenly observing the surroundings. The plan was insanely simple. We were to capture the presidential palace and force the island's leader to resign. The new palace master was to seek help from neighbors, who were to provide immediate assistance. As soon as the neighboring country's paratroopers began to land on the island, we were to leave its shores and return home with a tidy sum in our pockets. We had 12 hours for the entire operation. The country was small, the army and police were few, so no major problems were expected. And that's exactly what happened. Without firing a single shot, we occupied the presidential palace. The guards didn't even attempt to resist. The president, a puppet of a European colonial country, 
quickly resigned and handed over power to his successor until early general elections. I got the impression he was even glad to be done with it. An hour later, a transport plane landed at the capital's airport, and paratroopers from a neighboring country poured out. Not waiting to meet them and without saying goodbye to the new leader, we quickly retreated and soon a helicopter was carrying us over the open ocean to our ship. A few days before the court, I received the DNA test results. I wasn't expecting anything new. It was clear the kids weren't mine. But I was in for a surprise. According to the tests, I was the biological father of both children. This outcome was unexpected. Probably even Vera didn't know. Or maybe she did. Who knows with these women? The divorce went through without much trouble. The complication arose from the fact that the children were mine, at least on paper. In reality, raised by my ex-wife's family, they were entirely on her side. A bunch of witnesses confirmed that I drank, beat, and cheated on my wife. The children were left in the care of my mother-in-law and father-in-law, and I supposedly showed no paternal feelings. The children confirmed this. Outwardly, I remained calm, but my heart ached, not from my wife's infidelity, but from my children's betrayal. I wonder what they were promised. A bike or a scooter. In court, I was thoroughly smeared, accused of all sorts of sins. Even those I had considered friends, or at least good acquaintances, who I had helped in their time of need, joined in. The trial resembled a well-directed play, where everyone knew their part and recited the scripted lines on cue. The accusation of infidelity was particularly ironic. Apparently, I often went on long business trips because I had a mistress, or several. All the time we were married, I tormented my poor wife and children, humiliating and even occasionally beating them. Vera, from a mere adulteress, became a victim of domestic violence, deprived of care and affection. She was, it seemed, forced into the arms of a lover in search of comfort and peace of mind. I listened to this nonsense silently, not objecting or arguing. The elderly judge with a horse-like face looked sympathetically at Vera. Women's solidarity. All men are scoundrels, and we women are naive fools. The verdict, divorce, alimony. I could see the children only once a week and only in the presence of their mother. I listened to the decision silently, head bowed. When it was all over, I saw the guilty look of my ex-wife. Tears filled her eyes. As we left the courthouse, I asked Vera, Aren't you ashamed? She lowered her eyes and slipped past me silently. A woman is like time, sometimes flowing, sometimes leaving, sometimes you don't know how to kill it. I wonder how my ex-wife's life will turn out. Will she marry her Italian toy boy? But, whatever happens, it's very hard to convince a former lover, now your husband, that you're incapable of infidelity. It was getting dark. A chilly autumn wind tried to peel the yellow leaves stuck to the wet asphalt. Street lights came on. I walked slowly along the rain-drenched street, passing my shadow like a baton from one lamp to another. I felt disgusted. Disgusted that I had lived for so many years with a lying, cheating creature. Surprisingly, I was calm. No despair or regret. I got a good vaccination against family life, but how things will turn out in the future is unpredictable. As I entered the dark archway, I caught a barely noticeable shadow moving towards me from around the corner. I stopped, listening to the night. Again, something flickered to the right, very close. With an animal instinct, which comes alive in moments of mortal danger, I realized they were after my soul. I pulled a folding knife from my coat pocket and with a flick of my right thumb, snapped the blade open. The click of the hardened steel suddenly calmed my nerves, and I froze, trying to make out my unseen adversary. It was so quiet I could hear his breathing. I stepped to the left and froze again, waiting for the attack. It was slightly brighter on the street than in the archway. A lonely lamp oozed a thin, rattling light nearby, and I caught a glimpse of the unknown assailant moving towards me. This wasn't an attempt to hit me, he was trying to kill me. I dodged the blow and leaped aside. The fight was real fierce and merciless. We didn't circle around, knives drawn, like in unrealistic movies. 
Without waiting for another attack, I lunged forward, trying to grab the enemy's armed hand and strike him with my knife. But he managed to intercept me with his free hand, and we froze, straining our muscles, trying to break free. The strength was equal, so neither of us could gain the upper hand. Finally, I managed to break free. We circled each other, exchanging blows, dodging, and parrying thrusts. The goal of a knife fight is to slash the opponent's arm or body so that the flowing blood weakens the enemy. My adversary was an experienced fighter, and I couldn't get the upper hand. Finally, I caught a moment when my opponent lunged and managed to drop to my knees. His knife hand whistled over my head. He fell through, and I managed to stab him in the unprotected left side. My knife plunged and up to the hilt, reaching his heart. The unknown fell heavily to the dirty asphalt, and the dropped knife clanged away. I quickly got to my feet and tried to see my opponent's face. To my surprise, I recognized the attacker as Snake. The very same I had recently fought shoulder to shoulder with. I wiped the blade on his clothes and pocketed the knife. The situation became clear. My restless father-in-law wasn't bluffing. Unable to remove me from the city peacefully, he hired a killer, but he didn't count on me not being a pushover. Bad luck. But for whom? The father-in-law or Snake? I realized I had to disappear, lie low for a while. Vanish from the radar. Revenge is a good thing, but when you're being hunted, it's not the time for vendettas. It wasn't clear yet. Was Snake a one-time hire or was my own agency hunting me? Well, time will tell.